Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Thank you, Tim, for leading us in prayer this morning. As June mentioned when the service began, we concluded a sermon series last week in the Paul's letters to the Ephesians. And today we begin a new sermon series through the Psalms. Um, we've done that for the last number of years using the Revised Common Lectionary as a kind of guide. Uh, following the psalm reading for this particular Sunday through the summer uh, and reflecting on that together. And today, the psalm that we're going to turn to is Psalm 14. Psalm 14 is actually a, a difficult psalm to read. I've, I've never preached on it before in my 20 years of ministry. And so maybe that's a good indication why following through the lectionary can be very helpful as it encourages and invites us to maybe reflect on scripture passages that we might not choose. Um, but Psalm 14 is a difficult passage. Uh, in fact, it's rather depressing at times. It was written by King David, uh, or at least attributed to him. And we don't know exactly the situation that he faced as he wrote that Psalm, but we can imagine it was rather dire and difficult. Um, but I do think even as we read it, we might think of instances in human history or maybe in our own lives when we can connect with some of the emotion and the expression in Psalm 14. So as we read that together, though much of it feels rather depressing, there are instances of hope, glimmers of hope. And I encourage you to listen for those instances of hope and confidence that we come across as well. Psalm 14, this is the word of God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all humankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord. But there they are overwhelmed with dread, for God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and be glad. Thus far, our reading from God's word. Psalm 14 and another one very much like it, Psalm 53. In fact, if you read them together, you'll see much of the language is almost identical. Each talk about people who say there is no God. For us today, when we read that statement, we immediately think of people in our day, maybe prominent ones like the name Sam Harris might come to mind, or Richard Dawkins, or Christopher Hitchens. Prominent people, or people like them in our culture, who genuinely believe there is no God. There is no supreme being in the universe. The material world is all there is. When we think of this statement, there is no God, our minds naturally go to them. And yet, we actually have no historical evidence to say that there were people in David's day who believed that. We would have no real evidence that people in David's day would deny the existence of some supreme power or being and believe that maybe through some natural evolutionary process, this material world came about and that was all there was. So 
When David is thinking of those people who in their hearts say there is no God, he's thinking of what theologians have often described as practical atheists. Not atheists who genuinely don't believe in the existence of God, but people who may believe God exists, but live as though he doesn't exist. Who might believe that he's present, but live as though his presence and his purpose have no impact on our daily lives. Practical atheists. And truth be told, though there is a significant, maybe you would say, philosophical difference between those two kinds of people, right? People who genuinely don't believe in the existence of God and live how they want versus people who may believe in God but still live how they want. In some sense, that's not really all that different, is it? So what I'm saying is this psalm speaks not just to practical atheists, who, as we read through the psalm, are even present among the people of God at times. This psalm doesn't only speak to practical atheists, but atheists in our day too, those who completely deny the existence of God. And the psalm says believing that or living that way is foolishness, folly. In fact, one person has said that in some way, sin is foolishness. Living sinfully is folly. There is one particular book in the Bible that unpacks folly for us as well as wisdom. And of course, that's the book of Proverbs. Let me read a few verses from that book that give us some sense of, of the nature of folly from verse 22 or verse 15 of chapter 22. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. As parents, we know that's true. Our children are often foolish in the things that they do or maybe say. Part of being a parent is training the foolishness out of our children so that they might appreciate wisdom. Or from Proverbs 18, <clears throat> fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. How many people haven't we met who delight in airing their own opinions and pay little attention to the wisdom or understanding of others? Or a fool spurns a parent's discipline. Rather, the wise one is one who heeds correction and shows prudence. Just a few verses that you see don't just capture maybe the foolishness of a child, but even the foolishness of adults. Those who reject discipline. Those who take no pleasure in understanding, but delight in sharing their own and hearing their own opinions. What we see in the scriptures is that foolishness can be quite disconnected from intelligence. In fact, people who are very intelligent may be scientists or social scientists, academics, people who understand politics and culture, people who are quite bright, you might say, can even be fools. I want to take this moment to maybe give you an example of that kind of a person. And I do this with respect because I actually quite appreciate this person in many ways. Uh, you may know the name Stephen Fry, a British actor, comedian, but also a British intellectual. I've listened to him in interviews and talks and, and much of what he says I've come to appreciate. He even appreciates certain things about Christianity, about religion, but he has publicly declared himself to be a very committed atheist. And in an interview that he had about, I think, three years ago, uh, he was invited to respond to this question. The, the interviewer said, what would you say to God if you're wrong <laughs> upon your death? If you died and now met God, what would you say to him? Well, Stephen Fry replied with these words. Bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that's not our fault? 
It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world that's so full of injustice and pain? That's what I would say, Stephen Fry replied. That's a rather extreme response. No doubt he was trying to evoke some emotion. But it turns out that for many people who would describe themselves as atheists, this is probably one of the most compelling reasons they maintain that disbelief in God. They cannot harmonize evil in the world, suffering in the world with a God who is supposedly loving. And yet, if we just look at the argument itself that he presents, the Bible would say about Stephen Fry and this response and others like it, that it really is a kind of foolishness. I want to invite us to listen to these words from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is uh, a well-known Christian writer, philosopher, brilliant man, who at one point in his life was a disbeliever in God, a soft atheist, you might say, who eventually came to know Christ and commit his life to him. He too held this argument that Stephen Fry uh, offers, and this is how he begins. This is a quote from his book, Mere Christianity. He begins, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. Okay, that's what Fry just said. But how had I got the idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole show was bad and senseless from A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such violent reaction against it? A man feels wet when he falls into water because man is not a water animal. A fish would not feel wet. Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God would collapse too. You see, the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust. Not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. And so in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, namely my idea of justice, was full of sense. Consequently, atheism turned out to be too simple. The very claim that this world, or that things that have happened in the world, bone cancer in children, is unjust and wrong, that very claim comes from somewhere, doesn't it? Who are we to say that it's wrong? If the world was a product of accidents and chance, survival of the fittest, the strong devouring the weak, we would expect people in power to devour those who are weak. We would expect a kind of natural injustice, if you will. C.S. Lewis noted that the moment we make this argument against God, we are in a way proving that he exists, or at least some supreme being who has given and revealed to us a sense of right and justice exists. The psalmist goes on. He perhaps sees things happening in his world, just like we might see things happening, things like the terrible things of the 1930s and 40s in, in Europe under Nazism, or in communist Russia in the turning of the century under the leadership of Lenin and Stalin, the millions of people under fascism that suffered horrifically. We don't know what the psalmist saw, but we can sense as we think about things like that, that the Lord does look down on heaven 
from heaven on mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away and become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. What the psalmist recognized is that within the whole of humanity, there is this, what we could call a propensity towards foolishness, living according to our own standards, a living according to the Lord that is me. If you wonder about that, I want to share with you some responses to a Barna survey that was done in 2015. And under that survey and the, the response that they wrote, they talked about a kind of new moral code that is developing in our culture. A code that even Christians are appealed, appealing to. And I wanna share with you just a few statements and the response to those statements within this survey. Statements that you would, I think you could argue, are anything but Christian, and yet how our society has embraced them. The first one, the best way to find yourself is to look within yourself. 91% of U.S. adults agreed, 76% of practicing Christians. Or people should not criticize someone else's lifestyle choices. 89% agreed, 76% of Christians agreed. To be fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things you desire most. 86% agreed, 72% of Christians agreed. The highest goal in life is to enjoy it as much as possible. 84% agreed, 60%, 66% of Christians. People can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. 79% agreed, 61% of Christians. Now, as you listen to some of those responses or statements, you might say, well, there is a, maybe an element of truth. And yet as Christians, we see that in each of those statements, there is this kind of false uh, desire or false pursuit that's being held up, that's being pursued, one that isn't finally rooted in the scriptures themselves at all. Our highest goal in life is to enjoy it as much as possible. Our highest goal is, is happiness and comfort and pleasure and enjoyment. The highest goal is pursuing godliness whatever that might entail, sometimes even hardship and suffering. So you can see within a culture how we have, in many respects, shifted our loyalties. And even Christians are tempted in these ways to shift our loyalties and our, our desires and our affections towards these things. In a book that talked about this survey written by David Kinneman and Gabe Lyons, they write, the morality of self-fulfillment is everywhere, like the air we breathe. Much of the time, we don't even notice we're constantly bombarded with messages that reinforce self-fulfillment in music, movies, video games, apps, commercials, TV shows, and every other kind of media. So we can begin to see that when the psalmist is looking out, he's looking at a kind of general condition maybe a condition that we can see too. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, picks up what Psalm 14 speaks about, in fact, quotes it. As we read, Paul writes, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. It is true for us today, for those in our culture, to hear those words. They are probably the most politically incorrect things we could say. And yet, as we consider 
the way in which scripture reveals how life ought to be lived, we begin to see how a culture can become crooked, how its allegiances can go in directions not pleasing to God. We talked about instances in history when, when, those, when that kind of lifestyle hit us in the face, whether it was under fascism or, or different expressions of, of harsh oppression. In a very real sense, we can see how sin, living as though we are our own lords, is utter foolishness. And the Bible invites us to follow another way, the way of wisdom. I've appreciated much of the writings of one of my former seminary professors. His name was Cornelius Plantinga. He wrote a wonderful book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, a, a Brevery of Sin, uh, that was a bestseller and continues to be a, a delightful book, even, even though it speaks of a, a, a very depressing topic, sin. But he talks in that book, too, about wisdom. And he says, the wise person is the one who understands God's world and the knack of fitting into it. The wise person that is knows creation and gives in to creation. And I like how he puts it this way. He says, he gives in to God and he does that, he does the first, that is giving in to creation because he does the second, that is giving in to God. He knows that the earth is the Lord's and so the fullness thereof. He knows that wisdom itself is the Lord's. He knows some of the deep grains and textures of the world because he knows some of the ways and habits of its maker. This is wisdom. At one point he writes, the point of our lives is not to get smart or to get rich or even to get happy. The point is to, to discover God's purposes for us and make them our own. Another writer, this one out of the Quaker tradition, says a similar kind of thing, just in a different way. The power of a fully lived life or a truly learned mind is not a power to be sought or contrived. It comes only as we let go of what we possess and find ourselves possessed by a truth greater than our own. This sense that is the way of wisdom is, is discovered as people release their lordship over their own lives and submit to the lordship of God, the creator, the redeemer of all things. At one point, the writer of the psalm, as he looks around him, and sees what is deeply depressing, I suspect. At one point, he ends that poem with the words, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Oh, that God would change the hearts of the foolish. Oh, that God would intervene and make it possible for us to live in the way that he intended. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come from Zion. For the people in King David's day, Zion was the city of Jerusalem, particularly the temple itself, which was located there. For us, Zion is the heavenly dwelling of God. And we know that out of Zion, salvation came. Salvation came in the one who was described as the wisdom of God. Salvation came in the one who, who represented humanity in its fullness. Who was, we might say, truly human. Salvation came in Jesus Christ. The one in whom we saw humanity truly expressed, the one in whom we saw humanity united with God. Jesus was the, and is the God man. True humanity was found in Jesus Christ. 
in a book that um, was released, I think, a couple of years ago now, um, written by uh, Gabe Epstein. He speaks about, he, he, he's a, a, a chaplain for humanism at Harvard University, a chaplain for humanism at Harvard University. He's written a book called Good Without God, why a billion people believe that we can be good without God. And in that book, he argues for the, the atheist belief that we as human beings, as humans, can be genuinely good and pursue good without having to believe in any kind of supreme being. We can disconnect our humanity from God. Out of Zion came the one, that is Jesus Christ, who showed us true humanity is that which is united to God. True humanity is revealed in the one who is the God-man. Indeed, this is what the psalmist prayed for, and this is what we saw in the person of Jesus Christ. A woman by the name of Rosalind Picard, she's founder and director of a research group at MIT. She speaks about her coming to faith in Jesus Christ. She declared herself as an atheist, dismissed believers as uneducated. She says, as an educated person, at least I should read the Bible. And when I first opened the Bible, I expected to find phony miracles, assorted gobbledygook. But to my surprise, in at least the book of Proverbs, I found a book full of wisdom. And I had to pause and think as I was reading it. She read through the entire Bible twice <clears throat> and felt this strange sense of being spoken to. Part of me was increasingly eager to spend time with the God of the Bible, but an irritated voice inside of me insisted that I would be happy again if I just moved on. At one point, a college student invited her to his church, and the pastor got her attention when he asked the question, who is Lord of your life? Who is Lord of your life? I was intrigued, she writes. I was the captain of my ship, but, it, but was it possible that God would actually be willing to lead me? After praying, Jesus Christ, I ask you to be Lord of my life, my world changed dramatically as if a flat black and white existence suddenly turned full color and three-dimensional. I lost nothing of my urge to seek new knowledge. In fact, I was emboldened to ask even tougher questions about how the world works. Today, I work closely with people whose lives are filled with medical struggles. I don't have all the answers for explaining their suffering, but I know there is a God of unfathomable greatness and love who freely enters into relationship with all who confess their sins and call upon his name. I once thought I was too smart to believe in God. Now I know I was an arrogant fool who snubbed the greatest mind in the cosmos, the author of all science, mathematics, art, and everything else there is to know. Today I walk with joy alongside the most amazing companion anyone could ask for, filled with a deep desire to keep learning and exploring." End quote. I would say, in the language of the Bible, Rosalind Picard discovered what it meant to be truly human. As she encountered the wisdom of God in Scripture, particularly through the person of Jesus Christ, whom she invited to be Lord of her life, she encountered how it is that we can become truly human. You see, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But the wise person is the one who, in the words of Neil Plantinka, discovers God's purposes for us and makes them our own. The wise person is the one who has repented of the need to be Lord of their own life, who has repented of that and accepted the forgiveness of God that comes in Jesus Christ. 
and has submitted their lives to be joined to his. For true humanity ex is expressed in union with God. The wise one is the person who has committed their life to the one who has come out of Zion, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through his death, he removed the barrier of foolish sinfulness and opened up a way to be truly human, a way lived in union with God. In our baptism, God has joined us with himself. Union with God has been expressed concretely to us in our baptism. We belong to him. His spirit fills us. And we are able to live wisely as those who have been filled with the life of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, together we say, Amen. Amen.